rolling. Um, I hope you don't mind holding this. No. No? All right, great. Check, check, check. One, two, three. Check, check. Okay, not to be redundant, but check, one, two, three, Beautiful. one, two, three. That's perfect. Let me ask you a question. Why is this the heaviest microphone I know, in the I, world? I, I, these are those radio mics. These are the old ones, yeah. the old radio. They're, yeah. they're great. But they're heavy as now. Yeah, but you, you know, if you're, if, you're covering, if you're covering like a riot, you can bring down 15, 20 people. <laughs> this is... The, i never seen anything like that. You really could kill somebody with one of these. Oh, easily. <clears throat> wow. This will be the first time I've done shows and walked out with a hernia. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Interview with the Artist. I'm your host, Walker Vreeland. And we are here at Bay Street Theater with a legend in stand-up comedy. He holds the record for the number of guest appearances on The Tonight Show, over 150 appearances, and he has guest hosted the show 75 times. David Brenner, welcome to the show. Thank you. Let me, let me tell you about records so they get, they get this straight. I also, let's talk about the records, all right? I also did the most Mike Douglas shows besides Don, Johnny Carson. I also hold the record as being the most frequent guest on television uh, talk shows than anyone, any entertainer, any time. Now, right? it's amazing, right? Here's how amazing it is. So let's say after we do this, I say to you, look, you want to get a little bite? And get, you know, get breakfast, and then the crew, come on, we'll get, okay, right? We all go out, and we sit, and we have a good time, we have laughs, and I pick up the check, hey, I got it, you know? And I walk up to the, uh, the lady at the cashier's desk, and I say, yeah, here, I, I did the 158 Tonight Shows, I did the most Mike Douglases, I appeared as a guest on more talk shows than any entertainer in the history of television. She say that's thirty-seven dollars and fifty-two cents. <laughs> what, what are you saying? Worth. No one cares. No one. Ca what a record, you know. And a hundred years, no one will remember what anyone ever said or did. Like a hundred years ago, who was the leading? Here we're in a theater. Who was the leading thespian in, in the United States a hundred years ago? Uh, uh, I have no, no idea. No one has any idea. And it happened to be. I would think it's the Edwin Forrest, who was an amazing superstar actor. Was he really? Yeah, and no one cares. I don't even care. I don't know how I remembered his name. I'm probably the only one who did. Now, of all those yeah. guest appearances, can yeah. you remember each one, or is it all just like one big Tonight Show blur? Well, I, I can't separate. I know the first one. And I sort of know what I did in the second one, maybe. And after that, I, I wrote. I kept writing. You got to keep writing. I mean, I, I started doing the Carson. It was January 8th of 71. Uh, and other comedians, like the comedians, there hadn't been a comedian really, a new comedian for about six years. So someone got a six-year jump on me, at least. Someone got a 10-year jump on me. And I hold the record. So I had to do 158 in a shorter number of years. Are there any particular shows that stand out in your mind that you always remember? Of Johnny's? Yeah. Yeah, I remember a lot with Johnny. I was on the show where he, uh, he took the, uh, the woman who used to take potato chips and, and see famous people on them. Uh, you know? She said, yeah. Really? She, yeah, she'd hold up and say, John Wayne. And it was John Wayne. It was amazing. Like she was reading tea leaves? Yeah, yeah. She, yeah yeah, this woman must sit at home buying potato chips and going through potato chips. And she had one. She says, Here, here's one of my favorites. It's, uh, and, and this is uh, uh, President Roosevelt. And Johnny took it, and she was reaching, looking for the other one. And Johnny switched it with a regular potato chip. And it, mm, mm, he tastes good, too. The woman looked back. It was cardiac time. He just ate the President of the United States potato chip. <laughs> Yeah. So you continue to perform, uh, and I know you had a permanent show in Las Vegas, uh, which is where you lived, not anymore. Yeah. Um, and I hear you've been hard at work on a new show uh, that, of course, it's happening this evening at Bay Street Theater. Uh, tell us about the new yeah. show. Well, the new show, I wish I could tell you about it, because I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be doing, <laughs> because it's one of those situations. No, I had to live a lot. Of course. And that, that, that isn't... Uh, yeah, no, that's my way. I write, I write on stage. 
I really do. 95% of all the jokes I've ever done have been written on stage. But that's not to say, that's not a qualitative statement. Because the, the, the man or woman who stays at home and is writing jokes on, on the computer or the, the iPad or, on a, or just writing jokes is just as talented as someone like me who has the jokes just fly out for some reason. Yeah. I don't know how it happens. You know, I always ask me great musicians and you know, lyricists and all, how do you think of music? How does music come? Why do you, you're walking down the street, you think of music. He says, well, how do you think of jokes? I said, I don't. When, when I'm on stage, it's a gift from my father. I just live it. Sometimes you see me laugh because I heard the joke for the first time and I laugh. And, then, and, and the mu musicians always say, well, it just comes in my head. Yeah. That's all, it just pops in my head. Well, you really are known for your ability to ad-lib and improvise. You're also known as one of the originators of uh, uh, observational comedy. Yeah, I, I, st I started, yeah, I started that. Yeah, I was, o I was always that way. Uh, even as a kid, I, I saw all the dumb things in society, the dumb things we do and the dumb things we say. And so I used to make fun of it that way, never thinking that someday I'm going to be on television and I'm going to be doing this kind of thing. Right. And it took off. It took off like a meteor. I mean, and then, and then I had all the followers. And today I would still say that observational comedy is probably still the leading form of comedy uh, today. And, you know, and, and, but the difference is, like everyone says, boy, that's a something that you started that. And I say, yeah, but I'm not one of the comedians who walked away with $450 million. <laughs> Right. It. Where's my porgy money? Yeah, where, 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 where's my money, money for all right. those great, great successful TV shows that use <laughs> observational <laughs> comedy? Right. You know, how about a little check here, in the boys and girls? Well, you're, you're also known for, your, for being extremely current. I mean, what happened that day. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any time you're not coming up with material? I mean, are you really only coming up with material right before you go on stage? Are you at, do you ever come up with material when you're at home? I come up with premises. I, I do a lot of research. And I'll, I'll, I'll read the morning paper and papers. I'll read the papers and television and news and, and, and listen to radio and news. And, and then I uh, or check it out on the Internet. And I'll come up with something. I'll say, there's something funny about that. I don't know what it is, but there's something that can be funny. So I cut it out. I put it on a 5 by 8 card. And I pile it up with the other cards. And then I turn the cards. And I hope I think of something funny. Now, if I don't, I just flip the card. Okay? And that's the end of that. Yeah, but now, here, in, you know, in, in here in this theater tonight, um, I don't have a place to really put the cards. I'll probably do a little cheat sheet of some something, some ideas. I think I'm going. I think I'm going to talk. I might. I might talk about my career, and I might talk in you know, a little bit more about me than I usually do. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, I don't have to memorize that. I don't have to put a card down. Born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yeah. I, I kind of know it. Yeah. And you yeah. know where you are right now. You're in no, uh, Sag I, Harbor. I, you have no idea. Oh, I'm. Way worse knowing where I am. No, no idea I, where I, he is. Yeah, but I know where I've been, but and, and I don't know where I'm going, but but I know where I've been. Yeah. Yes. Most people can't even remember. They'll say, "Oh, we went there. Oh, where was it? We went." I know where I went ten years ago. I don't know where I'm going in five minutes. I know. <laughs> what I love and what's amazing about you and what I love about you is that it seems like you live to challenge yourself. Uh, you, you come up with material so fast that it, it enables you to take enormous risks and really walk the high wire uh, as a performer. Do you ever get nervous? No. I, I, I bombed one time horribly. Early in my career, and I was with my good friend Steve Landisberg, who passed away about a year ago. And and great, great actor. actor. Oh, Steve was, and, and the fun, he, who was the funniest? He was the funniest. With us, the guys that we all started together, mm -hmm. and uh, there was no one funnier than Steve Landisberg. And he was supposed to follow me in this club. And he didn't. He, he, he left. I bombed. It was horrible. And I came out on McDougal Street. And I said, I used to take a little over-the-counter tranquilizer. I think it was called something like Milltown and Motown. No, that was a record company. You know, I, didn't need, I didn't need an album. It was, um, I think, Milltown. Anyway, and it was just to calm you down. It was over-the-counter. Sure. 
And I said to Steve, I said, that's the perfect bomb. Not only didn't they laugh once, they hated me. I'm lucky I made it down the aisle and got out of there. I said, and look at me. I'm, I'm fine. My arms and legs are working. You know, I can think. I said, I'm OK. There's no guy coming out of the alley with a baseball playing, let's get a Jew today, you know, which was a common thing <laughs> in my, in my neighborhood. neighborhood. <laughs> so I said, what am I getting nervous about? I'm walking. Look, the legs are working. My arms are working. And I threw the little Milltown things, whatever they were, the tranquilizers, and I was never nervous again until right now. That's amazing <laughs> until right now. Until right but now. that's amazing to have that perspective. I mean, as most performers, when they bomb, uh, I mean, I, I know that when I don't do well, I, uh, I really uh, give myself a lot of abuse. I mean, I really... Uh, uh, I, I, that, you never did that. You never yeah, beat yourself up. In a hundred years, I said it. No one's going to remember anything we said or did. It's, great it's not a big deal. There's over seven billion people in the world. The fact that you bombed in some club and people didn't laugh in the, in the, in the scheme of the whole world is a, is a little, is a, a flea. That's all it is. Yeah. So why are you getting upset about it? And the great thing about doing stand-up comedy is that you're as good as your next show. You see? Right. Whatever you did tonight, the next night you can make up for it. If it, went, what, if what, it didn't go well, and you got complete recovery in 24 hours. You did that HBO special that was live. Uh, I mean, talk about a high wire act. Yeah. You had no safety net. No. no. I, I sold the idea. I went up to HBO. I said, I got an idea for a special. It was, it was my fourth, fourth HBO. I said, I want to do an hour live. Not live like the other comedians. They do like six or eight shows, and then they edit them together and make a perfect show. And they call that live on tape. Right. right. That's, That's not live on tape. It's an edited show. Mm -hmm. I want to do it live. We go on the air live, and the show ends live. Mm -hmm. It's in real time. Real time, and I want to do it on current events and the news. I'm going to make jokes about right before I went on stage, because I watched the monitor. I was watching the news while they're getting ready to introduce me and, and making little mental notes of what's going on. So I just went out there, and I let it fly, and it was no safety net. As a matter of fact, they came up with the ad where you have me laying down on a high wire over Las Vegas. That's, That's great. great. No nope. safety net. That was never done before, and it's never been done since. Because you, you have to have a lot of guts and stupidity combined to do something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. Now, speaking of current, event, uh, current events, I'm going to mention a few current events, and I'd like you to comment on them, okay. if you wouldn't mind. A divisive issue, but I figured we'd get it out of the way. Trayvon Martin, sure. George Zimmerman. Trayv, I'll make a statement, and I, I'm, I'm going to state this 100% absolute. Trayvon is dead. Zimmerman is alive. Oh. <laughs> I feel really bad laughing about that, but... Um, That's uh, it. <laughs> it's very simple. Next. My favorite word in life. Next. I love it. Paula, Paula Dean. Dean. Paula Dean. I know, very, very controversial issues. What do you today. think of call Paula Dean? I think, uh, I think there's certain things. I think there's certain words that some people can say and some people can't say. Uh, and um, you, do you agree with that? What I look, I, I grew up. I spent 12 years as the only white kid in a black neighborhood, and I heard the word all the time. But everyone was saying it, and. Um, and they didn't say it with hate. Mm -hmm. I, I think that like Mel Gibson and Paul, these people are bigots. Mm -hmm. They're bigots. bigots. I agree. They're full of hate for a certain group of people, whether it's black people or Jews or mm -hmm. whatever, Italians. They, they have, these are hate, people with hate inside. Mm -hmm. She was arrogant enough to expose her hate. Now, the thing to do when that happens, except money comes, you know, money comes in the window, you know, you defend yourself. 
She should have just said, this is how I feel about it, and I'm, I'm cooking. And that's it. You want to learn how to cook? Come to me. I'm going back and, to the kitchen. And, yeah. And, I, and if you notice in my kitchen, there are none of those things in my kitchen. I mean, be what you, what want. you want. Exactly. If you want to be that spiteful and that ignorant and that mean, be it. Right. Don't pretend to be full of right. I remember on, one, on some talk show recently, she brought, uh, uh, she brought out this young black man who... She was. It was like she was putting him on display. Uh, oh, look! This is a friend of mine. I love this man. Uh, he is a dear to my heart. Um, and uh, exactly, be what you are. Don't. Uh... Yeah, and then to try to she's trying to recover from it. From it. Yeah. Yes. Can't look. There are people who are going to hate other people for the rest of the time. There are people on this earth. That's the way I grew up in a neighborhood full of hate. People who hated other people and all that. It's everlasting. It's given for all time. So I think these people, like Mel Gibson, he was drunk. You can get drunk if you don't have hate in your heart for people because of what their skin is or where they're from, or whatever it is like that. If you don't have hate in your heart, then you could be on anything. You could be on morphine, coming out of a morphine thing. You could be drunk. You could be shot with all kinds of drugs. You know. You'll never be a hateful person. You'll never say those words. And you'll never have to worry what comes out of your mouth yeah, under the influence. It's, it's just your nature, and it's all learned. I mean, Mel Gibson's father doesn't believe that the Holocaust happened. happened. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, and there, there are millions of people who don't believe it, and a lot of them mostly because they don't want to believe it. Right. right. But it happened. Yes. But this is his son who obviously didn't pick up a book or meet someone with numbers on their arm and talk to them. Exactly. There's nothing you can do about that. So how are my jokes with this? My jokes oh, are good with this. I, 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 so far, I, I incredible. See people at home. They're laughing so much. Oh, <laughs> Grammy's talking about that hate. Oh, that's so funny. Okay, okay, Michael Douglas. Uh, Michael Douglas's throat cancer caused by oral sex. Did you hear about that one? I heard about it. Mm, it's the most time I've ever said cunnilingus on the air in one well, day. Well, all I can say about it is I was lucky. <laughs> still, still healthy after, after all these years, years. Yeah, in spite of all that, I in spite of all I'm that. Probably healthy because of that amazing you've also written several books uh the most recent being uh, i think there's a terrorist in my soup uh it's a guide on how to use humor to cope with personal uh problems as well as how to cope with the problems of the world right. and and this is uh, something you learned early on right i mean how to use humor to get through painful situations. Well, my father, who was the funniest man I ever met, um, he once told me when we were talking about, I was still a kid and, and there was already anti-Semitism had already entered my life and all. I was just a little boy in fights and all that kind of thing. And my father said, you know, when you grow up and you become a man, you're gonna have people who are gonna hate you for no other reason than you're Jewish. Now, yes, it is so stupid, but it's there. Now, what you do is you try whatever you can to talk them out of it. You can tell them about the, the people. You can tell them what we've accomplished in the world. Or, you know, we, whatever we've done that other people haven't done, that we've been great leaders and, 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 and intelligent, you know, uh, visionaries. Yes. And you can and you do can all that. You could talk about our history and how we've overcome every country that tried to kill us is no longer a country and every people who every people who tried to kill us they no longer exist. We have out, we are the cockroach of human beings. <laughs> all right? You can try that. But the main thing is to try to make them laugh. <clears throat> because if you make someone laugh, he can't hate you. You can't be laughing. <laughs> you're, I'm going to kill you. You're, you're, you're horrible. horrible. Your, your skin, skin is dark. dark. <laughs> ah, you, can't, you can't do that. See? He said, now, this is what he added. If you've done all that, if he still hates us, then you give him a reason to hate us. Exactly. So I would go through the whole thing, and then I know, and I always would say this at the end. Is there anything I can say or do to change your mind in this matter? And if the guy said no, I busted his nose as a starter. That's, uh... Now, in my book, I don't tell you to do that. 
I tell you to stick with the humor for yourself. Right. right. Something happens to you. It's bad. It's not going to get better for a while. Find the humor in it. Yes. What's so funny? I remember when I was a little boy, we didn't have any heat in the house, and we didn't have furniture for a year. We slept on the floor. And one night, it was really cold. The coldest room was my bedroom. It was on the second floor in the back. It was coldest. And I didn't want to complain because I knew family's going through a rough time. I was going on age nine. And my father poked his head in the door and he said, uh, he called me Kingy. It's my nickname. He said, Kingy, how you doing? I said, and I use his first name because I said, you know, he's my best friend. And I call my best friends by their names. So I called him Lou. So I didn't want to complain, but it was unbearable. And I said, Lou, I'm, you know, we slept with our clothes on. I said, Lou, I'm... I'm really cold tonight. He said, well, do what I do. Sleep on your stomach and turn, and turn on your stomach and sleep on your stomach and cover yourself with your back. <laughs> now, that's, now that's funny. funny. <laughs> and I laughed. That was really funny. And I don't remember the rest of the nights being cold. It's amazing. It's amazing. The, power the power of the mind. mind. And the power of comedy. Yes, yes and the power of comedy. The, the power of, you, you can. You know, if you, if you just force a smile... When someone forces a smile on the face, just smile, you know? You can't have a bad thought. You can't sit outside and smile and think something bad. Just to force a smile. Now, if you take it to the nth degree, the laughter, if you laugh, you can't hurt. You can't hurt. And laughter is this great, what it is to me, it's a salve you put on a wound until you can get to a hospital or a doctor to take care of it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like, like a salve. salve. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it just tied over the, tied you over. You, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to break your arms while climbing, and then tell yourself jokes for the next ten hours and not notice your arms are still broken. You talked about your dad uh, and and how his humor rubbed off on you, uh, his humorous outlook. And, and way of getting through tough times. But you were also born funny. I remember the last time we talked, you said that you don't think of your humor as a talent. You think of it as a gift. Yeah, it's not a talent. A talent is something you decide to do, and then you read all you can about it, you study about it, you practice it, you work with people who do whatever it is you want to do. You spend all this time and effort. When you are given a genetic gift, of humor, where I always see the funny side of everything, thanks to my father. Then, this isn't a talent. I was making people laugh when I was talking at age four, making grown-ups laugh. It's not, it's not, it's not a talent. It was a, it's a gift. It, you know what it's like? I remember the first job I worked, I got paid $35 at a place called Pips in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. I was shocked when the guy paid me. He's paying me to be funny. This is shocking. That's like paying me, like coming up to me and saying, how tall are you? I'm, I'm six two. Uh-huh. And you have dark eyes, dark brown eyes. Yes, I do. Here's $35. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. I had nothing to do with my height, you know? I had nothing to do with it. Why am I getting paid? Yeah. I don't want you to take this and tonight I'm going to do the show here and not get paid. Free. Free. Yeah, right, right. That, <laughs> Ladies that's and not gentlemen. Funny. I, I can tell you, that's, right. not, that's not funny. No, definitely, definitely not. No, not funny. I, have I have to tell you before we wrap things up, your website is so clever. I, on the homepage, you, you tell everyone basically that your website is really a virus uh, and that your computer will become corrupt at any moment. Yeah. Uh, the, in the contact section, it lists your manager, your agent, your, your, your assistant. And then you list your urologist. Yeah, well, he's very important to me. Josh Fingerman. Yeah, Josh Fingerman. Uh, uh, Dr. Fingerman. <laughs> also says in your website you're the founder of oldjewreview.com. Uh, yeah. w- what's the premise of this? Oh, old Review, and we're thinking of starting it up again. I came up with an idea. My son's a graphic designer, and his, his pals are creative geniuses. And, and I said, you know, I can't, I don't, don't know these games, that kids play the games. I said, what, what, about, what about we were talking and up and back about it? What about I go on and you, you take me trying to do the game? And just whatever I say, whatever comes out, whatever is it, 
and we have it as an old Jew review of the games. So every time a new game came out, we did a review of it. And we were getting 10,000 hits and more Amazing. for games. And I, I know the part, part of the premise is, is that you, you review the newest game releases having never picked up a controller or played any of the games. Yeah, but what I do is I will, after it's all over, they'll show me the game. And, and, and I, or when I'm doing it, I pick up enough to see that the graphics are great that the storyline is moving and, and exciting. Right. right. And then, then some of them are, are dumb or bad, and I, I would say it. And then I gave it uh, kosher pickles. So like five, five kosher pickles was the finest, finest review I gave. One kosher pickle was... <laughs> <laughs> you're 77 years old. You're still going oh, strong. No, am I? Uh, yeah, oh. uh, so I've read. Uh, yes. Do you think you'll ever stop? Who, who, who lives to be 180? <laughs> you think you'll ever stop performing? performing? Right after this show. <laughs> tonight, 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 I'm walking out, out, out of here. here. And I'm just, you know what I'm going to do? You know, there's a story of the man who puts an oar over his shoulder. He's, he work, he's been at sea all his life, and he's, he's leaving. And enough of the sea, and he put an a, a, a oar over his shoulder, and he walked. He kept walking. And he kept walking until the day that someone said to him, What's that on your shoulder? And that's where he lives. I'm going to walk and tell jokes. And when I tell a really good, funny joke, and some guy goes, I don't get it. What are you talking about? That's where I'm going that's to live. That's the moment. That's it. David, David Brenner, Brenner, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's good seeing you again. And uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm Walker Vreeland here uh, at Bay Street Theater. And we'll see you next time. Ciao. God, you're brilliant. Oh, thank you. That was fantastic. Let me ask you one question. Yeah. Did you want to ask him, I'm sorry, this trip from Philly to New York City, does that make any sense? Yeah. Not really know. Do you want to no, know? it's okay. Look, I'm wearing a shirt. Pat. Because people would find it, I think, well, I would find it. How do you go from Philadelphia to New York to play Pippins? How do you end up in Brooklyn? Well, I didn't away? do comedy in Philadelphia. Right, you see, that's what I'm saying. You I, end up with her Pippins. I, I was a writer, producer, and director. I did 115 documentaries. Documentaries, that's right, yeah. You want